We're live now. Okay. I think we will get started. People will uh, trickle in. Um, <clears throat> Thank you everybody uh, for joining us and uh, thank you Kapil uh, for taking time. I know it's uh, evening for you, Saturday evening. Uh, thank you for your time, but uh, we, we really wanted to have a conversation with you about uh, your book and uh, as we go along, we will learn more about it, but I'll, I'll give you a very brief introduction of uh, Kapil. Kapil Komiradi, uh, he is from my hometown, Hyderabad, India. He has written from South Asia, Eastern Europe, and the Middle East. And my, his work has appeared among other publications in the New York Times, the Washington Post, The Economist, The Spectator, Times, Los Angeles Times, CNN, The National, The Jewish Chronicle, Foreign Policy, Boston Globe, Chicago Tribune, Tablet, Daily Beast, London Review, New Public, New Statesman, Newsweek, Guardian, Daily Mirror, The Australian, <laughs> Le Mans, Diplomatic, The Independent, The Times of India, Hindustan Times, and Haaretz, and I don't know how many more. Um, but today's conversation is uh, uh, mostly about his uh, book called Malevolent Republic, A Short History of the, of the New India. It was published uh, and uh, with the critical acclaim in the UK and India, and it is now available in USA also. It's a fast moving history of uh, Indian Republic from independence in 1947 to Narendra Modi's re-election two years ago, and the first comprehensive account of India's slide into sectarian authoritarianism. Our guest today, um, will help us understand a uh, little more better how it happened and uh, his perspective. Uh, I think we have a, a very, very uh, uh, astute observer who is, uh, who spectator, the, the European magazine has called him the VS Naipaul of his generation. So we are talking to V.S. Naipaul of our generation. So with that, Kapil, I, I would like to first ask you what, what prompted you to write this book at these times? Well, first of all, uh, Rashid, thank you so much for having me and to the IAMC and to everybody joining us now. Uh, thank you for taking the time. I know how valuable your time is, especially during Ramzan. So. I'm, I'm, I'm very pleased and honored that you've invited me and that so many people are joining us to share in this discussion. Uh, in response to your question, Rashid, this book began originally uh, as a limited project. I was invited by my publisher, Michael Dwyer in London, uh, who said to me, he knew my politics, uh, and he said to me, would you consider writing an overview of India's transformation since Narendra Modi's election in 2014. Uh, I agreed to do that. And when I started writing the book, it occurred to me that to write only about Modi was to pretend that Modi was an unexpected phenomenon, you know, when in fact Modi was the consequence of so much that had occurred before him. So I started peeling the layers. Uh, I didn't want to quarantine Modi from the history that gave rise to him. And I went back a decade before Modi, then a decade before Modi, then another decade. Uh, and then I started at the beginning of things, which is the birth of the Indian Republic to understand how we found ourselves here today. And the project evolved over time uh, from being simply an overview of uh, uh, India's transformation under Narendra Modi into uh, India's history since 1947 to Modi's re-election two years ago, as you mentioned. So it ended up being a rather comprehensive account, but I also wanted it to be accessible to people who didn't know much about India's history. Um, 
and I wanted it to be brief because we in India have uh, a reputation for being rather long-winded. You know, as somebody once said, one Indian is a monologue, two Indians is an argument, three Indians is two political parties. So I wanted to keep it short and brief and make it accessible to people, which I hope I've done with this book. Thank you. Very interesting. Um, <clears throat> I I have a, a couple of questions. Uh, I, I actually bought the book and and uh, did not finish it yet. I'm close to that, but so far, whatever I read, um, the this book uh, begins with a poignant recollection of your re friendship with a Muslim schoolmate in Hyderabad, who was later tortured by the authorities. It also introduces us um, to the origins of Hindu nationalism, mm. India's partition and its consequences. The older secular India of your parents' generation was already beginning to disappear in the late 1990s. Tell us a bit about the origins of Hindu nationalism and the changes. Right. So. Thank you for uh, bringing up Hyderabad because it's very important to what has happened uh, in India's history. Um, Hindu nationalism is really the communal awakening among Hindus as a political, uh, political community begins to occur, begins to take definite shape in the 1920s, right? Uh, in 1921, there is a massacre in Malabar uh, which is called the Mufla massacre, which is complex reasons. Uh, but that, after the massacre, the Congress party, which is really an umbrella organization for various pressure groups, you know, there are Muslim pressure groups, there are Hindu pressure groups. Uh, a lot of these Hindus feel that the Congress party hasn't, uh, hasn't condemned the massacre uh, in Malabar uh, in stentorian terms quite loudly. And a lot of people peel away from Congress. And in 1925, uh, RSS is set up by a man whose family originally is from Hyderabad, actually. His family fled religious persecution from there, settled in Nagpur. In 1925, he uh, sets up the RSS with the idea of creating a political community out of this uh, Hindu community. And in 19, at about the same time, uh, these, uh, uh, Vinayak Savarkar has published his book, which is the blueprint of uh, Hindu nationalism, and he arrives at this idea that Hindus really constitute a race uh, that are uh, autochthonous to India, that are, that are the native children of India. And anybody who comes, uh, India is the sacred land of Hindus, and anybody, anybody can be an Indian so long as he or she accepts that he's Hindu. Uh, but Muslims are excluded from this category, because Muslims especially are seen as people whose religion originated uh, elsewhere, and therefore they cannot be Hindu unless they, as he puts it, reconvert to Hinduism. Um, and this particular idea, it's important to remember, didn't really have a market beyond upper caste Hindu men at the time. Okay, there was a ma there was a very formidable Muslim Hindu collaboration against the British Empire, but once Pakistan was created. Uh, as a homeland for India's Muslims, an idea rejected by uh, many, many m Muslims. Uh, I would say an overwhelming uh, majority of Muslims because uh, Indian Muslims outnumber the number of Muslims in West Pakistan. Uh, once Pakistan was created, this idea acquired legitimacy because a lot of people started saying, if Pakistan is the homeland of India's Hindus, what remains is logically the homeland of India's Hindus. If Pakistan is the homeland of Muslims, then India must be the homeland of Hindus. Obviously, as we know, uh, India's first dispensation, uh, led by Nehru, uh, of which uh, Maulana Azad was a fundamental part, uh, they say, no, this cannot be. You know, uh, India will not become a Hindu Pakistan. India will not react to the provocation of Pakistan uh, by making religion the determinant of citizenship in India. No matter who you are, what your religion, India will be uh, one country. The, the old actor, Raza Murad, used to define it in this way. He used to say that when we say Ham Hindustani, you mean Ha for Hindu, Ma for Muslim, and everything in between. That is Ham Hindustani. Uh, that's how generations of Indians interpreted what it meant to be Indian. 
uh, obviously the RSS and you know the the its its Hindu nationalist brethren were so aghast at this idea of India that they they gunned down Mahatma Gandhi, one of one of Savarkar's proteges, gunned down Gandhi. And at that time, they lost a lot of their credibility and their legitimacy, and they were driven out of town. And what they did, Rashid, is they farmed out across India. They farmed out across India and fomented over many, many decades a bottom-up revolution. They would go to villages and they would, you know, brainwash people into thinking that they had been victimized by, you know, Muslims for centuries. And the only way they could get their uh, revenge was by self-consciously identifying themselves as Hindu, uh, as a politically conscious Hindu community. And Hindu nationalism really breaks through as a powerful, formidable force in the 1980s during Rajiv Gandhi's tenure as prime minister. And by the 1990s, they've stitched together a coalition. My parents um, sent me to a madrasa as a child, uh, primarily because a lot of people do not realize this. We think of partition as something that happened in Punjab and Bengal and Kashmir. But partition also uh, seared through Hyderabad. Pa partition ravaged Hyderabad in a very, very painful manner. Um, and there was a lot of violence, especially after partition, uh, after Hyderabad's liberation. There was, you know, there were massacres of Muslims. And my family was uh, caught up in all of this. And my parents' generation, my parents especially, believed that I and my family should be inoculated against anti-Muslim prejudice later in life. So they wanted to expose us to, you know, Muslim culture, uh, ordinary Muslims, most of all. Uh, so we lived in a predominantly Muslim neighborhood, which was, which was a self-conscious choice of my father's. And I was sent to a madrasa as a child, and where I befriended, uh, you know, among others, a very particularly fascinating man who... Uh, who became a very good friend of mine and our paths went in different directions. And when I met him again years later, I discovered that, you know, while I had nursed a nostalgic uh, idea of India in exile, he had been exposed to the roughest edges of India and he'd been picked up, accused of terrorism and tortured very brutally. And he had to leave India. Uh, he, you know, uh, he, you know, he was done with India and he became for me really uh, he epitomized for me uh, in so many ways the experience of Muslims who had pledged allegiance to India and how their innocent faith in India was shattered. You know, his, his parents' generation, his parents' generation, completely believed themselves to be Indian, uh, committed to India, Indian nationalism, Indian pluralism, Indian secularism, and he uh, had to leave India. And I used him as the starting point in this book because it was a very, it was a, it was a, it was an experience very personal to me because he was a very dear friend of mine with whom I'd lost touch. And then when we reconvened as friends, um, you know, his life had been shattered beyond repair. Fascinating. Uh, <clears throat> your book uh, is basically divided into two parts. One is called Antecedents and the other is called India under Modi. While you were very, um, uh, very uh, unforgiving uh, uh, for Modi, for all he has done, I don't know if there is anything he has done that is forgivable, but um, you were also uh, quite uh, critical about Congress party and uh, how the, 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 the Gandhi family or Nehru family uh, runs the politics. Can, can, can you elaborate on it? Right. So um, the Congress Party, it's important to remember, Rashid, is, was for many decades indistinguishable from the Indian state. The values of the Congress Party were the values of the Indian state. You know, Congress, India was secular because Congress was secular. India was uh, non-aligned because Congress believed in non-alignment. India was socialist because Congress attached itself to socialism and so, so on and so forth. Um, the problem begins with the India's independence. Congress Party is not a political party so much as it is a movement for India's liberation from British rule. And once India achieves freedom from British rule, Congress Party has an enormous fund of goodwill among ordinary Indians. Uh, Mahatma Gandhi says uh, that Congress should be disbanded because you're going to be an unfair beneficiary of people's uh, goodwill and you're going to be voted into power. In order to foster a truly multi-party democracy, we need to dis uh, you know, uh, break up Congress party. 
uh, and he's ignored. And then obviously in 1948, he's gunned down. Um, Nehru, for as long as he's in power, Mm -hmm. uh, Nehru has his own authoritarian tendencies. It's very important to remember that. Uh, we tend to airbrush that. We tend to deify him. We need to humanize Nehru. Uh, Nehru presided over, you know, uh, farce in Kerala when the democratically elected government was dissolved. Uh, he presided over an anti-democratic farce in Kashmir. And in the east of India, you know, he enacted the Armed Forces Special Powers Act in 1958 that gave impunity to forces uh, 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 putting down insurgencies. Uh, but at the same time, all of these authoritarian, authoritarian tendencies existed alongside uh, a genuinely democratic personality. Nehru often didn't get his way, and he was accepting of the fact that he didn't always get his way. He attended parliament regularly. He deferred to his colleagues. Uh, he abased himself before the judiciary just to uh, emphasize that uh, the power of the judiciary uh, over the executive uh, and so on. But after Nehru's departure, uh, when Mrs. Gandhi takes over in 1966, uh, after uh, Lal Bahadur Shastri's death, she has a very interesting conversation with an American journalist who asks her, who, she tells him, uh, you know, do you think any of these other people can hold this thing together? And he says to her, by other people, by this thing, do you mean the Congress party? She says, no, I mean India. You know, there is an extraordinarily uh, arrogant streak running through the Gandhi family at this stage. And they believe that they are a native aristocracy. And by 1968, Mrs. Gandhi, unable to brook the accumulating dissent against her, uh, splits the party, expels her rivals. And this is when Congress begins to transform into a family thief. And after the war of 1971, when Bangladesh is born and Pakistan that was created in 1947 ceases to exist, Mrs. Gandhi becomes the most popular democratic leader in India. Um, there's no rival to her. And 1975, when the Allahabad High Court uh, passes its decision, uh, announces its, de its decision to annul her election to, to parliament, she decides to uh, suspend the constitution and rule as a dictator for the next 21 months. This is the moment at which a lot of people are disillusioned by the Indian state and by the Congress party, because the Congress party is indistinguishable from the state. And what they see as a symbol of hope uh, becomes uh, uh, an instrument of persecution. And at this time, Sanjay Gandhi comes out of the woods. Uh, he raids state banks he enriches himself. Uh, he starts a car factory that doesn't produce a single car. He gangsterizes the Congress party by filling its upper echelons with his yes men. And obviously he orders the clearances of slums, most notorious instance being the Turkman Gate slum in Delhi. Uh, he, wants to, he then starts the sterilization camp, which is effectively born out of his belief that India's greatest problem is overpopulation. So he orders the sterilization of people and there are roving sterilization squads. Some of the people attending this talk may even remember it if they're old enough. Um, you know, these squads just descend upon railway station bus stops and pick up any man of any age and then surgically mutilate that person. And in, in, in villages, you know, people start hiding in the farms, men start hiding in the farms because they want to evade the sterilization squads. By the end of the emergency period, Sanjay Gandhi has succeeded in sterilizing, surgically mutilating 6.2 million Indian men. That is 15 times the number of men mutilated by the Nazi regime. Uh, and the cult of personality erected by Mrs. Gandhi was unrivaled until, until Modi came on the scene. There are 450 government projects, schemes, buildings that bear the name of that family. There's the Sanjay Gandhi National Park in Bombay. There's the Indira Gandhi International Airport in Delhi. There's the Rajiv Gandhi International Airport in Hyderabad, uh, worth hundreds of millions of dollars, these schemes. And that is the template that Modi, to some extent, to a great extent, has exploited. But this is, the Cong without the Congress party setting the precedent, this is the moment at, at which India is really jolted. Uh, without this, in the absence of this moment, I think it is inconceivable that uh, Hindu nationalism would have achieved the legitimacy it did because Mrs. Gandhi's actions really discredit 
the founding, the foundational principles of Indian democracy. And a lot of the people who fight to reclaim Indian democracy are socialists, communists, but also Hindu nationalists. Uh, and, and they then become legitimate claimants for power after 1977. In fact, they come into government uh, uh, in a coalition government. That, uh, <clears throat> so, uh, in a way, I mean, you're, you're I guess, you're very clear that that, that today's uh, autocratic uh, India is paved by at least Indira Gandhi's emergency period. Yes. And what all happened in that. But you are also very critical about uh, Manmohan Singh, you know, who is. Uh, regarded as one of the very successful, uh, not only prime minister, but uh, finance minister. And he, he brought all the reforms to India, what today India's economic, uh, economic standing is, uh, uh, is very much uh, kind of credited to uh, Manmohan Singh's economic policies when he was finance minister, then later on prime minister. Um, so much so that when Barack Obama uh, calls him statesman and guy, you call him India's Pinochet. So, what what's that uh, dynamics about it? Well, a big part of the reason is that my friend was tortured uh, under uh, Manmohan Singh's government. Uh, so there was a lot of. It's very important to. I, I like to remind people that when Dr. Singh became India's finance minister under P.V. Narasimha Rao, he, uh, when he unveiled his first budget in 1991, he said, I promise that in dealing with the people of India, I shall be soft hearted. Uh, Dr. Singh believed in liberal economic therapy in order to benefit Indians. But eventually that economic theory became an end in itself. It became an ideology for him, and he pursued it at the cost of Indians. Sonia Gandhi uh, tempered some of his impulses, but in her absence, he was, uh, Dr. Singh, you know, pushed India to the limits. And I'll give you some examples of this. Uh, for the 10 years that he was prime minister, every year but two, 16,000 farmers killed themselves. 16,000 every single year. And many of them wrote letters directly addressed to the prime minister, begging him, you know, to intercede, to blaming his policies for their fate. And a lot of the Aboriginal populations that sit, the Adivasis that sit on, uh, that sit on treasures, you know, mineral riches, that India's new, newly rich uh, caste of plutocrats, uh, robber barons need. Uh, Rather than engaging in dialogue or consultation with these Adivasis, with these, uh, uh, with these uh, tribal rural populations, uh, Dr. Singh's government ran out of patience fairly quickly. Yes, I admit there was an armed insurgency, but in 2009, uh, the government started something called Operation Green Hunt. Um, and his government contemplated, this is the staggering thing, contemplated using the Indian Air Force uh, against the most destitute people because some of them had picked up arms. Uh, there was no notion of uh, democratic conciliation, uh, attempting dialogue with these people. It's, uh, we often forget that today, if you oppose Modi, you are denounced as an anti-national. Uh, under Dr. Singh, if you opposed his policies, you were denounced as anti-development. Uh, development was the word that sanctified and justified every action. Uh, there was extraordinary violence in the countryside. And Dr. Singh is often, often credited with moving hundreds of millions of people out of poverty. But it's very, that, that, that phrase doesn't really quite explain that a lot of people were moved out of uh, dire poverty and into barely tolerable destitution. Remember, that India became a trillion dollar economy in 2007. Uh, by 2009, uh, it had added 42,000 members, I believe, to its club of millionaires. Uh, by uh, 2010, 
uh, eight of the richest people in the world were Indians. And yet 46% of uh, Indian children were malnourished in 2011. Uh, and 400 million Indians lived under the poverty line. Um, so Dr. Singh was wonderful for India's haves, uh, not so great for India's have-nots. And he presided over income inequality, unprecedented income inequality. And it, le it, it was the Supreme Court of India. It was, it was left to the Supreme Court of India to upbraid him for pushing the poor to the wall and unleashing violence in the countryside with predatory forms of capitalism supported by the state. Um, and in the age of Modi, we feel nostalgia for Dr. Singh, but it's important, I think, not to forget, uh, uh, I, was it Milan Kundera who said that the power of man against, the, the, the struggle of man against power is the struggle of memory against forgetfulness. And Modi's authoritarianism should not make us forget that what came immediately before him was no paradise for millions of our compatriots who do not have the privilege you and I have. Uh, if you were in the countryside in India, if you were in uh, Chhattisgarh, for instance, uh, Manmohan Singh was not a statesman uh, fated in the capitals of the West. He would have struck them very much as General Pinochet struck the people of Chile. I did a lot of pro bono work for people who were exposed to the roughest edges of Dr. Singh's government. And I dealt with these people and they had been brutalized by the state. Uh, when this enlightened ruler was ruling us from Delhi. So that is the reason why I, I, I'm not harsh to Dr. Singh. I just describe the way India was when he was ruling for people who were marginalized by the press. These, these stories were not covered by the press uh, for the most part. These were stories that were neglected. The things you saw on the TV and in the newspapers when Dr. Singh was prime minister was, uh, you know, beautiful stories of rich people partying in Goa and about IPL matches, and about how India was going to be the next superpower. And I thought it was very important to emphasize the other side of the story. And uh, when you do that, I think Dr. Singh doesn't come off that well. You, you mentioned, uh, uh, you mentioned age of Modi. Uh, <clears throat> the, in the age of Modi, the age of Modi uh, for the for rest of the India beyond Gujarat and even uh, perhaps even uh, globally started with the massacre of Muslims in Gujarat and um, and he was called modern day Nero Nero and butcher of Gujarat and um, he was banned to come to United States and at some point even UK. Um, but yet he managed to become prime minister of uh, the country or just describing, you know, starting from Congress party and Indira Gandhi and, and also Manmohan Singh. So is there any, any kind of correlation or any continuity to your, the, 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 I, I think that the name of the book, I, as I was reading it, begin, began to dawn to me why you called it malevolent uh, republic, because it just didn't happen one day. It, 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 it kind of evolved into malevolency. So Modi is what, in the scale of one to 10, where, where it is now in India, of this malevolent republic. Well, I, I, I... I described Modi, uh, you know, Modi is the consequence of a lot of mistakes that occurred before Modi came into power. Uh, even in 2002, Rashi, it was inconceivable to most of us in India that somebody like Modi could ever be the prime minister of India. Uh, when the massacres in Gujarat happened, uh, when you saw the stories filtering out of Gujarat, uh, people being butchered on the streets of Gujarat. Uh, there was outrage everywhere in India. Uh, if there were celebrations, if there was uh, solidarity with Modi that was concealed and muted and hidden, uh, the legitimate, acceptable reaction in public was outrage. 
and Modi was pretty much a pariah in all of India, right? Uh, Rajpai wanted to sack him. Uh, this is a matter of public record. And the RSS intervened and said, you <coughs> cannot sack him. And Vajpayee deferred to the RSS in one of the great misjudgments of history. Uh, and what Modi did, if you remember, is he, he refused to apologize for the riots in Gujarat, but for many, many years, he, he didn't really have an, he was seen as, uh, he was heavily stigmatized. Uh, you know, he wasn't allowed to enter what is known as polite company. Um, and what Modi did is he reinvented himself. He reinvented himself as uh, an efficient manager of the economy. He hired uh, a public relations firm in America called APCO. Uh, he invited investors to Gujarat. And one of the tragedies of India is that the red tapism is so, uh, so pervasive that if you apply to start a factory in India, uh, your grandson will end up manufacturing cars if you apply to start a factory today. Uh, and what Modi did is he offered expedited clearances to people. If you remember, Ratan Tata wanted to start a factory in Bengal. Uh, he couldn't. They were, you know, they were, they were protests that culminated in riots and bloodshed. And Modi brought him to Gujarat and gave him a clearance within a matter of days. And Ratan Tata went on stage and praised Modi as the kind of leader India really needed. And by 2009, 2010, when Modi was deodorizing his reputation, India was enthralled to the idea that it could become the next superpower, uh, the economic superpower for sure, because of the kind of economics pursued by Manmohan Singh. Uh, the newspapers in Delhi, uh, the television networks in Bombay, they were selling, they were purveying this idea that, you know, uh, liberal economics will lead us to become the shining India uh, in the coming years. And Modi was seen to be the man to get us there because in his second term, Manmohan Singh's administration was bogged down by protests. Uh, there were, there were anti-corruption protests led by people like Arvind Kejriwal. Uh, we can dig into that. Uh, but M Modi, uh, uh, Manmohan Singh's administration was paralyzed. Um, and Modi set himself up as, in his first time, when he first ran for office in 2014, he projected himself not as the Hindu supremacist, uh, but as the technocratic inclusive modernizer. His slogan was Sabka Saf, Sabka Vikas. Uh, he said, good days will come for everyone. He promised to clean up the Ganges. He promised to build smart cities. He promised to repatriate all the illicit cash stashed in foreign bank accounts and, and deposit $15,000 in every Indian's bank account. These were the promises on which he ran in the first term, or certainly the promises he amplified. He obviously you know, had the dog whistles on the side, but these were the promises he amplified because India was still, at the time, uh, a secular country in the sense that if you believed rabidly in Hindu nationalism, if Jai Shri Ram was your slogan, you were not seen as a credible politician. And Modi had to come to power and change the country uh, to legitimize that kind of uh, politics. And that's what he's done. Uh, something that, that was heavily stigmatized is now, you know, is now acceptable. You know, prejudice that used to lurk in the corners, in the margins of Indian society has permeated the mainstream. This is what he's, he achieved over his first term. But Modi's, you know, Ashish Nandi, uh, the, the distinguished author and trained clinical psychologist, met Modi when Modi was a campaigner for the RSS. And I will read out what he said. Um, he said, Modi met virtually all the criteria that psychiatrists, psychoanalysts, and psychologists had set up after years of empirical work on the authoritarian personality. He had the same mix of puritanical rigidity narrowing of emotional life, massive use of the ego defensive projection, denial and fear of his own passions combined with fantasies of violence, all set within the matrix of clear paranoid and obsessive personality traits. I still remember the cool measured tone in which he elaborated a theory of cosmic conspiracy against India that painted every Muslim as a suspected traitor and a potential terrorist. Nandi emerged from the interview shaken. He said, he said, 
I had met a textbook case of a fascist and a prospective killer, perhaps even a future mass murderer. This was Ashish Nandi's impression of Modi when he met him decades before, as, as, uh, when, when Modi was a campaigner. And Modi was extremely deft at selling himself as an economic modernizer. And there was not adequate scrutiny of Modi from uh, India's press uh, and a lot of India's public intellectuals, just as they had done with Indira Gandhi. Uh, Koshwan Singh, Rusi Karanjia uh, were among the top Indian journalists who, when Indira Gandhi was presiding over uh, presiding over India as a dictator, they they you know they were composing uh, tributes to Indira Gandhi. Similarly, when Modi ran for office, uh, a lot of people. Um, a lot of distinguished people who subsequently changed their thinking were telling those those who were concerned about Modi that you know your fears are very exaggerated. You know this man has changed. Uh, I remember uh, a professor at Brown University uh, said he could detect Modi, you know, modernizing himself, changing with the times. Uh, Gurcharan Das, who's a prominent public intellectual in India, uh, he basically said, you know, if it's a, if it's a choice between secularism and economic growth, you know. Uh, damn secularism, let's go with economic growth. Uh, and uh, Jagdish Bhagwat uh, said, you know, if Modi doesn't come to power, I don't see any future for India. Uh, uh, I'm not quoting him accurately, but that was the gist of what he said. Um, these people never pause to ask, you know, this is a man who presided over carnage. Uh, so should is he, is he qualified to be the man to lead the most pluralistic nation state in the world. Um, the irony, of course, Rashid, is that he's not even a competent manager of the economy. Uh, he presided over a calamity of joblessness, uh, and he's now presiding over the detonation of India's economy. Uh, so on, on every measure, by every measure, Modi is a phenomenal failure. Um, but what he's done in his first term is unleash the Hindu nationalism that he was, he very cleverly uh, subordinated to this image of an economic efficient manager of the economy. I can't hear you, I'm afraid. Where, where Modi has failed on, on the accounts you mentioned, um, mm. he has succeeded in, in persecuting Indian minorities, especially Muslims. Mm. In in past six years, I mean, he started before that, but as prime minister, um, and you 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 get into quite a bit of details of it. Um, could you please, uh, for you know, listeners and for my refreshing my memory, if you could get into because that was quite uh, your approach was uh, uh, different than others I have read before. Right, so uh, this begins in 2015, uh, the lynching. It starts with a man called Ahmad Akhlaq uh, in Dadri. His house is, you know, uh, a short distance, uh, you know, a hundred miles or so from the prime minister's residence. And he is dragged out of his house, accused of uh, eating beef. And he is beaten to death with bricks. The remarkable thing then is this, uh, the remarkable result of the killing of the lynching in this village that Muhammad Akhlaq had lived for, uh, with his family. The Akhlaqs had lived there for generations. Uh, they, their family at partition chose to live in India. They, they actually didn't leave that village. They chose to live in India. And they, they shared meals with the village, uh, with their Hindu neighbors, uh, you know, they were like any other Indian community in most of India. You know, there was, they attended uh, Hindu festivals. Uh, during Muslim festivals, they gave food to Hindus. Uh, they were friendly with their neighbors. They were, you know, they were a, they were a respected family, hardworking family. And one of their children worked uh, in the armed forces. Uh, and then when he was killed, the reaction from BJP politicians was not one of outrage against the killers. It was outrage against the family that was bereaved. They were saying, ah, Akhlaq did eat beef. 
Uh, and one of the politicians leading that accusation was Yogi Adityanath. Um, and this was, I think, a, a turning point because this is when the prime minister could have come out and said, what has happened is horrendous. He didn't. Precisely a year later, he appointed Adityanath as the chief minister of India's most popular state. Uh, if there was any doubt of the prime minister's sympathy, I think that action cleared it. And after that, there have been so many killings uh, of Muslims. It's not just the killings, it's the theater around the killings. You know, uh, Muslims aren't just, Muslims haven't just been slaughtered. It has been operatic almost, the way in which they've been killed. Uh, the killings have been filmed, the films have been shared, uh, murder reels circulate, you know, on WhatsApp groups. And we needn't list every single killing, but it's, it is enough of a phenomenon, the lynchings especially, that mothers in northern India uh, are worried. Parents are worried when Muslim children leave home. Um, and the prime minister has not once, not once, memorialized by name a single Muslim slaughtered by the passions he himself has aroused. You know, his entire career has been about arousing Hindu passions, and he hasn't once memorialized a Muslim killed by these passions, devoured by these passions. And what has happened is a lot of Muslims have, I, I believe a lot of Muslims will, it will take a very long time for them once again to trust uh, the trust that held these two communities together has, has, has become severely damaged. And to restore that trust will take generations now. And that is the greatest casualty of Modi's rule. Uh, I don't think there's ever been a time when Muslims have felt as much as they do now as second tier citizens in India. Uh, it's not just that they are persecuted, it's that people feel that they can persecute them and get away with it. And you remember that a union minister went and garlanded 21 people convicted of killing uh, a Muslim man. And that is, that is effectively the government blessing murderers, convicted murderers. Um, and when you see that, when, as a Muslim, if you are seeing that, uh, how can you go back to trusting the state? I think it will take an extremely serious amount of work, intensive amount of work to restore the trust that is indispensable to India's survival. Um, and Modi has done more to incinerate that trust than any prime minister before him, anybody. There's absolutely nobody who's done that, done as much as he has done. And I think eventually that, that, that fury he has uh, unleashed will also devour Hindus. You know, uh, it is already devouring Hindus because the people who came for Muslims who are bad will eventually come for Hindus who are deemed to be not good. Um, and ultimately in India, all of us, every one of us, uh, you know, you could be you could be devoured by these passions for eating an incorrect meal, having you know an interfaith romance. Each one of us is one step, one misstep away from being consumed by the furies, uh, uncorked by the prime minister. Um, and I think a lot of Hindus somehow nurse this delusion that they th their religion protects them. It doesn't. Uh, eventually, you know, these people will also come for. For the Hindus, and no other prime minister, to reiterate myself, has done more to harm India's uh, plural fabric than this prime minister. And I cite every single example, every single instance in the book uh, of how the prime minister has gone about doing that. So essentially, you're saying there are no no uh, institution that democracy is built upon. Uh, or independent or left to check it. Yeah, that's a very good point, uh, Rashid, because democracy rests upon the capacity of autonomous institutions to check the executive. And what the prime minister achieved in his first term in power was the subversion of autonomous institutions. Uh, can you name one institution, a single institution that can reign in the prime minister? Parliament, the elected sovereign of India effectively functions as a 
bulletin board, not as a debating chamber, but as a bulletin board uh, for the promulgation of the prime minister's vision. Uh, the armed forces uh, have been politicized. You know, their achievements are used for party political gains and nobody objects to it. The judiciary uh, has faced an existential threat. A lot of, uh, a, 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 you know, justices of the Supreme Court held a press conference saying that uh, they, they faced an existential crisis. But after that, the Supreme Court you know, went mute and it hasn't uh, contravened the prime minister or the regime. It hasn't stood up to the regime. The election commission uh, has functioned. You know, the election commission is a marvel to behold. Indian democracy has survived in large part because of the impartiality of this body. And it has started functioning as an extension of the ruling party. Uh, remember electoral bonds? This is a scheme by which anybody can give anonymous donations to uh, political parties. The election commission uh, said that this was a bad idea. Within two days, it's reversed its, it reversed its position and said this was an excellent idea. Whatever happened in those two days, I wonder. Uh, and it has, it has done many other things. Uh, again, I cite those in the book, those examples in the book, uh, that, that give lie to the idea that it is, it is an autonomous body. I cannot think right now of a single institution, the press, the free press, that did so much, uh, you know, that, that, that amplified the protests against Manmohan Singh. Uh, in 2013 and 2012 and 2014 has done nothing to, to amplify the protests against the prime minister. And these protests against the prime minister, be it against the CAA uh, or be it against the triad of farm laws, they are the largest in India's history. Uh, some of the largest protests in India's history and the most powerful media houses behave as though nothing is happening and everything is wonderful. Uh, so there is no, the RBI, the Reserve Bank of India is another institution, the educational institutions, the universities, uh, there is no autonomous institution that, is, that, that can rein in the prime minister's authoritarian tendencies. And our greatest tragedy, of course, Rashid, is that we do not have an opposition party to take on the prime minister. So India has become effectively uh, a de facto, or is in danger of becoming very, very, very soon, a de facto one party state. You called India a malevolent republic. At the same time, uh, in the book, you also uh, expressed uh, hope and optimism that uh, there is a level of uh, uh, level of activism or response to it, uh, both in India and globally. Um, can you, uh, this is my last question. After this, uh, we will ask uh, listeners you know, if they have any questions. Can you elaborate uh, from your perspective, what is that you see that, that is hopeful uh, that within India is happening and also globally? And as, a, uh, as an extension to that question, uh, from your perspective, what is that, um, we in the West or anywhere outside India uh, should be doing? Well, thank you. Uh, so to unpack that question, the first question was about the activism. So uh, let me tackle that. If you, the first term of the prime minister, as I mentioned, was uh, about subverting autonomous institutions. His second term is full of citizenly backlash. You have seen an extraordinary uprising against the prime minister's decision to amend the citizenship law and uh, club it with the NRC, his threat to club it with the National Registry of Citizens. Um, from north to the south, east to the west, there was an eruption of citizenly protest. I was in Bangalore, Delhi, uh, Hyderabad. There were protests everywhere against the prime And these protests were led by Muslims, but they also contained Indians of all religions. Uh, in Shaheen Bagh, for instance, if you went there, you saw uh, elderly women, uh, you know, sitting with pictures of Gandhi, Nehru and Ambedkar. Uh, you know, they were, they were tried. There was an attempt to portray them as, as jihadis, uh, as one Hindi news anchor put it to me. Uh, but their holy book was the Indian Constitution. Uh, you know, their holy song was the national anthem. 
and their symbol of protest was the Indian flag. You know, this was the most uh, intensely nationalist protest there has been. Perhaps, I cannot remember the last time there was a protest of this kind. And this was a people's protest, unlike, unlike Kejriwal's protest against Manmohan Singh. Um, and then now you see protests against the farm laws. You know, again, there is an effort to portray some of the Sikhs as fifth columnists. Uh, as people with sympathies, with clandestine sympathies for the Khalistan movement. But this is turned into one of the most sustained, largest protests in human history, uh, in recent history, for sure. Uh, what is lacking? This, this ought to inspire all of us. You know, Indian democracy is not dying. India's institutions are dying. It's the people of India who are playing the role of the opposition. Uh, and this, this ought to hearten us. This ought to gladden our hearts. Uh, what is lacking in India is an opposition capable of converting the rage against the prime minister into a meaningful vote against this regime. That, sadly, India lacks. And that is India's greatest tragedy because the Congress party effectively exists to provide upkeep to the dynasty. Uh, there are many good people in the Congress party who would like the Congress to reform itself, to make itself fit to take on Narendra Modi. And there is another election coming up in three years' time. And the Congress party is exactly three years in which to uh, retool itself for a fight of our lifetime. And I don't see it doing that right now, that after these elections, the five elections that are happening um, in Bengal, uh, Kerala, and elsewhere, after that, if Congress performs poorly, which it is likely to do, uh, there might be an uprising within the Congress party. The Congress party might very well split. Um, if it doesn't split, uh, Rahul Gandhi, if he, if, he, if he truly feels any affection for India and steps away, perhaps there'll be effect, efficient, effective leadership of the Congress party that is able to take on Modi without pandering to the, you know, to the soft Hindutva uh, side of uh, the Indian electorate. And if that happens, I see hope of reclaiming institutional democracy. But I see a lot of hope on the streets of India. A lot of Modi has activated, uh, you know, a citizenly backlash. And there's a lot of engagement among young people. Uh, that, that ought to fill us with hope. Uh, Indians are taking it upon themselves to take on this government. But no democracy can survive like that. It needs institutions. And that will happen, I think, if the Congress party reforms itself. Because an organic opposition against the prime minister, an organized organic opposition to the prime minister, will take generations to construct, um, will take decades to construct. A party that can take on the BJP, that can have the funding, that can have the recognition, uh, that can have the candidates, uh, that, that will take a very long time. We already have the Congress party, and that just needs to be you know, updated, upgraded, to take on the prime minister. Right now, it serves the needs of India in, you know, 1990s. It needs to be uh, updated for the 21st century, for 2024. And that cannot happen with the dynasty. Rahul Gandhi was rejected by the electorate twice. You know, to go back to the electorate a third time with the same leader is not to offer it an alternative, it is to offer it an insult. And that's something the Congress party shouldn't do. Now to the question of what people such as you, your organization can do is, I think you, you've you done extraordinary work already. IAMC has done extraordinary work already. Um, I think to intensify the kind of work you do, to engage with ordinary Indians, to stand with Indians, uh, one of the things IAMC hasn't done uh, is discredit the Indian state. Um, IMC has very much stood with the Indian state and a lot of uh, diaspora Indians have stood with India. They have said, you know, they oppose this government not because they see India as evil. It's because they see uh, this government as a departure from what India ought to stand for. And that is, I think, the line, you know, I remember on Republic Day, some people, some hotheads went and uh, desecrated the Indian flag. Uh, or certainly, they didn't desecrate the Indian flag, but they certainly uh, violated the flag code. And it's important for all of us to remember that the that the Indian flag is our flag. You know, Narendra Modi is the imposter here. He belongs 
is the interloper here. Narendra Modi belongs to an organization that didn't even recognize the Indian flag for, 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 for many, many decades. Uh, this is our flag. You know, this is the interloper. This regime, this ideology uh, is the interloper regime, the interloper ideology. And we need to reclaim and wear with prides, pride the symbols of our, uh, our republic. And this, we ought to assert our ownership of the country. Uh, I, I met my MP in Hyderabad and he said to me, he's been hearing something a lot lately. He's, he's told to go to Pakistan. And his, he says the answer to that, and I agree wholeheartedly with him, is to tell them, the BJP people and the RSS people and the Hindu nationalists, that they should go to Pakistan. You know, Pakistan was created for people like that. Uh, India was created for people like you and me, for people who accept diversity and pluralism and accept uh, the fact that uh, we are greater than our differences. People who celebrate uh, the commonality of our differences uh, rather than killing each other over, over those differences. And I think we need to intensify our assertion of our Indianness. And that is something I'm trying to do in various ways, and I hope uh, people in the diaspora, in America, in Europe, uh, do that. Especially, especially uh, IAMC through your through through the IAMC. The work you've done is truly, truly stellar, and it, I think uh, you have a lot more to do. Certainly, while Modi remains prime minister. Thank you for that uh, uh, that detail uh, answers. Um... Kapil, I have a couple of questions on the chat. Uh, I'll sure. read it for you. Um, thank you for your support and standing for the oppressed community in India. My question is, how do you see the role of uh, NRI, especially, uh, especially not necessarily Hindu, supporting mm. this ideology? I mean, not necessarily Hindu, but Hindutva, uh, right-wing Hindu nationalists supporting uh, Modi government or RSS from abroad. Do you right. see? It? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think a lot of, I think it's very, for those of us who understand the ideology of the RSS, we need to speak plainly about what the RSS stands for. Um, these people sell themselves as Indians, but they, they are really partisans, advocates of one ideology that seeks to disenfranchise a lot of Indians, that seeks to turn uh, many Indians into second tier citizens if they had their way. And these people do not represent India. And it's very uh, crucial for the rest of us to amplify the kind of ideology the RSS is, while also making it clear that this is our battle. We need well wishes in this battle, but this is a battle that we as Indians will fight and win. Uh, because if we start inviting uh, one of the dangers here, I think, and we should tread very carefully, one of the dangers is if we invite uh, foreign intervention in India, as in you know, foreign hectoring of India, it, it tends to discredit our cause because we can be painted as people who are doing India down. And I think we, as I mentioned in my previous answer, we need to assert our Indianness, our ownership of India, and we just need to amplify the kind of ideology the RSS is. The RSS, Hindutva is a grotesque ideology. Uh, it is the ideology of uh, ethno-religious supremacism. And we just simply need to highlight that fact. We need to delegitimize that ideology by simply, you know, tell people what that ideology stands for and that'll discredit it. Uh, you know, their own words will discredit them. Uh, and, we need to assert our our ownership of India. Does that make sense? Have I? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, I'm sure we may have some follow up questions. Uh, I have one another uh, question here, Kapil, for you. Hi, yeah. Kapil. Thank you. What role, if any, armed forces can play in the current political scenario? That's a that's a very good and interesting question. Uh, the greatest role the armed forces can play is uh, by becoming even more neutral. You know, they, they, one of India's greatest, uh, greatest strengths uh, for the past 70 years has been the neutrality of its armed forces. Uh, something that you couldn't say of Bangladesh or Pakistan, 
uh, in India, the armed forces remain neutral. Uh, that is that is changing. So the upper echelons and the armed forces were always uh, very committed to the secular idea of India. Uh, I fear that may be changing. Uh, I mentioned in my book the dangers of you know trying to politicize the armed forces. Um, I know that one of the people, one of the men uh, qualified to become uh, the head of the armed forces was a Muslim from Kerala, Mohammad Ali Harris, and he was superseded by somebody junior to him uh, by the government uh, for reasons that are not entirely clear. Uh, imagine having a Muslim, uh, you know, head of the armed forces, what that could have done for the morale of the country. Uh, I think it's armed, armed forces must simply not become involved in politics in India. And we have seen a greater level of involvement, a greater level of uh, tacit support for the government's actions. Uh, we've seen the government uh, instruct schools to celebrate the armed forces. They don't need instructions from Narendra Modi to celebrate the armed forces. Most Indians are proud of the role played by their armed forces. They don't need uh, this prime minister, this regime to tell them uh, about the importance of the armed forces. Uh, and I think the armed forces should, for instance, a lot of retired soldiers did come out and say when, when a Bollywood producer was made to apologize for hiring a Pakistani actor, uh, you know, a political outfit asked him to give money to armed forces veterans. And a lot of veterans declined, declined to accept that money uh, because they, they didn't want their, their, the armed forces politicized. And that, that sort of, we need to see more of that. We need to see more of uh, the leadership in the Indian armed forces, India's military, army, navy, to come out and say that India, to assert uh, and affirm India's secular character. And that, that would really, that, that would do a lot to help India. Uh, so, you, I mean, are you saying that uh, currently Indian military is uh, neutral? Uh, that's precisely what I'm not saying, Rashid. I'm saying currently we are seeing signs of politicization of the armed forces. Uh, we are seeing there are decisions made by the government that should be separate from the armed forces. Uh, it shouldn't be, the armed forces shouldn't be performing or members of the armed forces shouldn't be performing the role of uh, PR agents for the government. And there are instances when it pains me to say uh, some members of the armed forces have performed that function. And obviously the experience of people in Kashmir uh, is not of a uh, politically neutral uh, uh, armed forces. Uh, I think they should, they should go back to being more neutral is what I'm saying. This is a very delicate subject and I want to be very yeah, careful yeah. in the words I use. Uh, I, I, it, would be very, it would be very helpful to India if the armed forces were to, on every given occasion, uh, assert their neutrality and uh, emphasize the supremacy of the constitution. Uh, something the current uh, head of the armed forces did when he when he took the oath of office. Uh, but I think I wish uh, it would it would be it would again I'm I'm trying to be very careful in what I say. Yeah, yeah. No, no, I got it. I got it. Yeah. Uh, it would be helpful if if they could say that you know yeah. if if they could emphasize the supremacy of the constitution. Yeah. Uh, another question, uh, this ideology has seen a widespread acceptance and has blocked further dialogue between communities. How do you see a hope for this breakdown so that an open dialogue be restored? What possible scenarios can be hoped or envisioned? Right, uh, so in places such as Hyderabad, my, my hometown, uh, intercommunal solidarity remains um, quite healthy despite inroads made by this government. In many of these places, uh, in intercommunal harmony has, has eroded as a result of the actions of this government. For instance, in Dadri, the Akhlaq family got on very well with their neighbors, their Hindu neighbors. It is after this regime came to power that that trust collapsed between these two communities. 
and this one family was persecuted very savagely. Uh, to restore that, I, I think there has to be an element, uh, I'm sorry to say, but there has to be an element of atonement uh, by Hindus. People who see themselves as self-consciously Hindus uh, will have to come out and build trust. I think the onus is on the Hindu community here because there have been instances of such gratuitous violence against Muslims. There was a young man going shopping during Eid. He was stabbed to death on a train. Uh, how can a Muslim mother in UP or in Delhi ever feel safe when a son goes out? Uh, ever, how can she ever be confident that the son will come home? This is something uh, a, a Muslim mother actually told me. That these were her words. Uh, how do you win back that confidence? How do you restore that confidence? I think it's not enough to speak of uh, intercommunal dialogue. I think it is the it is leaders of the Hindu community uh, who see themselves as Hindu who will have to build bridges, who will have to go out into the communities and say that, you know, um, you can trust us again. And it, it is they who will again have to go into the Hindu communities and speak up against the violence against Muslims. You know, otherwise we will see uh, tremendous, perhaps irreparable polarization of the society. And I think the onus is on, on, on India's, on India's uh, Hindus. To, to do this. Uh, when I say Hindus, it's, it's a very loose term. I'm quite aware of that. I'm, I'm thinking of community leaders. They're, they're, they're a dying breed. There were some, uh, Swami Agnivesh was one of them. Uh, we need figures who can not just inspire hatred, but also inspire hope and uh, trust and affection between the communities as we used to have in the past. And I'm hopeful that figures like that will emerge. Right now, there are figures like that, but they're quite afraid to come out. Because as I said, this regime will not just go after Muslims, it will also go after Hindus. Uh, but it, the onus will have to be on the Hindus on this one. Hindus who believe that India must be united. You, you answered one of the questions which I was going to pose, but uh, I have a couple of more uh, questions here. Uh, this may be not your expertise, you, you need not answer if you don't know. How much is known and understood about the sources and uses of RSS funds? Uh, I'm afraid I, I don't, I, it would be speculative on my part and I, I, it would be dangerous to answer that question. So yeah, I'll I understand, understand it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, another question I have is one of the bulwarks of democracy is a nonpartisan judiciary. This government has succeeded in completely politicizing these institutions. What is the response to this from within the judiciary? And, Right, within the judiciary, the people who have stood up, there's one instance during the Delhi riots, there was a judge in Delhi uh, who passed orders that the government didn't like and he was transferred overnight. Uh, within the judiciary, people who have stood up to this government have found themselves, uh, have, you know, have found themselves having to pay the cost of their independence. So there are if you speak to retired judges, because uh, serving judges are very reluctant to speak, uh, if you speak to retired judges, recently retired judges, they will tell you uh, that members of that of the judicial community are very alarmed by what is happening in India. Uh, but they're, they're, they, like everyone else, is quite afraid to cross this government. Uh, one of the myths in India, though, uh, a persistent myth in India is of the higher judiciary being a custodian of Indian secularism. I don't want to go too deep into this because we don't have the time, but I find that the higher judiciary has done a lot to sanctify and glamorize Hindu nationalism. Uh, you know, it was the higher judiciary that said Hinduism is not a religion, it's a way of life, which means that you can say Jay Sri Ram at a political rally and that won't be seen as a, a uh, you know, asking people for votes in the name of religion, because Hinduism is a way of life. Uh, Hinduism is uniquely granted the status of a way of life, while Islam becomes a religion. So if you ask for uh, votes in the name of religion, as a Muslim, uh, that is 
unacceptable. Uh, so I, I don't, I, I've never felt the kind of deep uh, affection or reverence for the higher judiciary that others do, while also feeling that the higher judiciary is indispensable. You know, some of their better judgments have, have, have truly uh, tempered the ruinous impulses of uh, some of our leaders. Uh, there are judges in India who are deeply, deeply alarmed uh, by what is happening, but like everyone else, uh, they're also afraid. We don't know what, how do I phrase this? We don't know what the government has on them. Uh, again, I'm quoting somebody here. Um, <clears throat> uh, sorry, Kapil, just a couple of more minutes. I oh, have sure, a question. I, I will mean, go ahead. Uh, do you see any current state in India that gives you hope for a sane India without this divisive and polarizing figures like Modi and Amit Shah or who will provide a reasonable challenge, I guess, to BJP? Right. Uh, that's a good question. That's a good question because, uh, you know, you will have had to travel a lot. To, uh, you will have, uh, you need to be uh, intimately familiar with India to be able to answer that with any degree of confidence. There are places in there are places in the Northeast that have succeeded in resisting to some extent, even though they're, they're falling. Uh, the allure of, the, uh, of, of Hindutva. Uh, there are places in the South that have, Kerala has resisted it uh, quite successfully so far. But it's important to remember that this ideology is always, always succeeding because it is, it is always making converts to its cause because it has believers on its side. You know, how many secularists are willing to give up their day job and go around catechizing for their cause? You know, how many of them will do that? Uh, it, is the, it, is the, it is the failure of the secularists that allows the Hindu nationalists to, to thrive. Um, I know a lot of people, a lot of young people are now setting up the, what they call secular camps to, to educate Indians uh, in, an, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a message that is antithetical to what the RSS preaches. But specifically to answer your question, I look at my state, which is now Telangana, and I feel quite hopeful because uh, I, I spent a lot of time traveling there not that long ago. And there is not the level of hatred there is in other places. Hyderabad, especially the capital, uh, there is there is uh, an abiding respect uh, and affection between communities. But I must warn you that the BJP is making inroads there. And some people feel rather complacent. They say that, no, the BJP was, will never win here. I'm not so sure of that. I think the BJP could very well win there. So uh, the, the moral of this is that don't be complacent. Uh, work to solidify this harmony uh, rather than sit back and think that this is a place that the BJP can never win in. You know, this is somehow uh, immune to the temptations of the message being pervaded by the BJP. There is no such place. And we can never sit back uh, and think that BJP will not win in such a place. Um, there is no inherent resistance to the message of the BJP. It will all depend on how hard those opposed to the BJP's message, those uh, who believe in a secular India, are willing to, how hard they're willing to work to stop the BJP from consolidating its gains uh, in the South. Make sense? Yes, yes, yes. Thank you, Kapil. You have any last remarks? It has been wonderful. I really, really appreciate uh, appreciated uh, the invitation, and thank you so much for the opportunity to address your members. And I hope this has been fun, uh, and I hope edifying to some extent. Uh, I hope to, you know, I wish you a happy Ramzan to everyone, and uh, good luck. Thank you so much for having right. me again. Thank you. Thank there, you. Some, we'll of, some of the topics we discussed were sensitive. So I was, I was trying to be delicate in the book, I'm not, but uh, you want to be careful about what you say. So uh, I hope you enjoy the book, those of you who pick it up. I hope uh, there's something there that you find useful. 
and I wish you all very well. It's late in the late where you are, so we wanted to keep you awake with some challenging questions. So. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Rashid. Okay. Thank you, Wonderful. Kapil. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, everyone.